Gradient Slashaholics, and welcome to another episode of Out of Print Slashers. I am Sean Campbell. I'm joined by the 80 Slasher Librarian, Joshua Rur. How are you doing today? I'm good, Sean. How are you doing? We have a special guest today. Absolutely. Would you like to um, introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Tim Wagner, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I've been writing for a long time. I've published around uh, 50-something novels, about half of them tie-in, half of them original, most of them in the field of horror. Uh, won four Bram Stoker Awards. Been teaching writing forever. Last 25 years as a full professor at Sinclair Community College. Teach composition and creative writing. Awesome. And where is that college again? Oh, in Dayton, Ohio. Okay. Yeah. I just, I moved, I just moved to Ohio. I'm, I'm in Cleveland right now and I'm, I'm still getting used to all the different colleges around. Um, cause you know, it's, it's really interesting. Okay. So today we're going to talk about a nightmare on Elm street protege. So this was part of the black flame series came out around, I think 2005 is what I have written down. Um, I really enjoyed this book. It feels like what I thought dream child was going to be when I watched Dream Child, and then there was another book written where they took the child from Dream Child and ran in that direction, but I like this one because it introduces a new set of characters, a new set of rules, and honestly, there were a lot of scenes in this book that I wish I had the visuals on, because I feel like when they were making the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, you could see where they, they said they flat out ran out of budget, but there's a scene in a video store in this book that I just, oh, that looks so cool when it happened that the fact that we just don't get to see that in a movie format is, I mean, they always, they, they could if they're going to make new Freddy movies, because I feel like every time they make a Nightmare movie, they have to reinvent the wheel when there's all these awesome books that have not gotten adapted. I would love to see this book adapted. So um, what, what did you think, Josh, when you were reading this? Oh, I, same thing. I thought it was a way better uh, dream child. Totally, completely. Uh, it was very refreshing off the book I came off of before it, uh, which was, I believe, Suffer the Children. Um, mm -hmm. I, like Protege, Nailed Freddy, Nailed the Nightmare Scape. I mean, everything. You must have been a big uh, Freddy fan before getting this this gig, right? Well, yeah, I saw all the movies as they came out. And, uh, you know, I found the the character fascinating, especially because when you kind of take the, all the movies, like as a whole, it's like these different layers of Freddy, which I found really cool to write. How did you uh, how did you get this gig at Black Flame? Like exactly how does that work? If that's okay to talk yeah, about. Yeah, this is like 20 something years ago, but in general, I'm I'm pretty sure that they did an open call. Maybe um it might have been like in the horror writers message board since they were looking for professional writers, maybe. Um, because there weren't so it wasn't social media yet, you know, like we have now. Um or, or it's possible they did an open call on their website and I stumbled across it. Um but however it worked, you know, I just I saw that they were you know, looking for these various lines because they were doing books for, you know, Freddie and for Jason and Jason X. I really wanted to write a Jason X book. Yeah. But I'll have to tell you what my idea was for it before they folded. I, I would have loved to have done this. Um, and I was going to actually I was going to do um, Final Destination book, but they they folded before I could do that one. Oh, man. So that they had these different lines. And, you know, so I just pitched. I had like, um, you know, paragraph length pitches for the different lines. And uh, the one they liked, it was not the one I wrote. They liked uh, one that I had an idea where Freddie, he's he's attacking a, you know, a woman, young woman in the dreamscape, and he's chasing her, but she has over her, her bed a dream catcher. And so from the dreamscape, she goes through the dream catcher, and he does too, but he comes out human. So it, mm. it traps his dream aspect on the other side or whatever. And so at first he's thrilled. I mean, he's, he's very confused, but he's thrilled to be back to life. And then, of course, you know, there's a lot of limitations to being alive. He can't do the things he could in the dreamscape, and he wants to go back, except something has taken his place as, you know, the ruler of the dreamscape. And I wanted it to be his dad. And uh, uh, I had written, uh, the editors asked me to write 60 pages of this, however much, just get started. Because if we don't have time, get started, which I will never do again. I wrote 60 pages and New Line Cinema took a look at this and they freaked out because they're like, we don't ever want to deal with the idea of Freddy being a human child molester ever again. And I already had a scene where, because it's been so long since he'd been gone from the real world, the kids had learned about stranger danger. I was just going to have him be at a 
looking at a preschool at the fence or whatever. And the kids are like, you know, get away, stranger danger. That was it. I wasn't going to do anything else with kids, but just to show that, you know, there wouldn't be as easy, you know, pray for him if he wanted to do that just as a small nod. But now I had to throw all that out and come up with something else. So I just threw protege together, the idea very quickly, just a concept. And they approved that and didn't have a lot of time to write it. So it turned out pretty good though. I think people seem to like it pretty well. Yeah. That was really good. And I love the dream, the dream catcher aspect uh, of that story as well. That's great. Um, I'm sorry. I feel like, I feel like we can't press on forward until I know about the Jason X. That's what I was about to say. That's what I was was, about to say. Yeah. My idea, because I love Jason X. I actually, it's the only time I went to the movies and the person at the ticket counter refused to sell my brother and me tickets. She said, it's so terrible. I will not sell you tickets. And we, we tried to explain, this is why we're here. Yeah. So finally, she made us promise that after 15 minutes, if we didn't like the film, we could come back and she'd give us any kind of, any tickets for anything else. So we got in there and I loved it. But, you know, I thought about it. And I said, okay, we got future tech. So what if some scientist in the future decided to uh, save all of Jason's victims by sending him back hmm. to kill, to stop himself? And so what I was going to do is have Jason X go back to each version of himself to try to stop him self and uh, he couldn't do it till he got all the way back to the first movie and uh the whole idea was that the galaxy would be populated by god knows how many thousands or millions of descendants of the people that he destroyed uh and maybe that would have saved stop the galactic war or something i don't know but i just wanted to do jason x versus all these other versions of jason and uh now nah, i didn't have a chance because the line folded before i could pitch it so Mm-hmm. so that's Look just in my head that th- this thing this book exists only in my head that already to... sounds like the best jason x that we've gotten like... <laughs> yeah i'm about to say we need to go back in time and uh you know just take alex johnson for a walk or something while uh while tim steps in <laughs> and instead of death moon we get we get okay the... no i know what happened now i can finally explain death moon i just watched back to the future one two and three and i can tell you what happened now so instead of you getting to write Black Flame, the other guy is like Biff when Biff got the sports magazine oh. <laughs> and it turned into a mess. So like we need to get go back in time and try to get this book written. And I hear he's a, he's a great guy. I hear he's a great guy. So I'm not putting that down. But yeah, the just, book is, the book weird, is really weird hard book. to follow. Weird book. Really hard to follow. They do have a Jason versus Jason, but I don't think it's actually Jason. I really don't know. It gives me a headache. Um, but yeah, that that's awesome. Wish we could have got that Jason X story. What See, about I'm... that um Friday uh, Final Destination one? Oh, oh yeah. that one. Uh, the, yeah, the editor was a big fan of um like European zombie films. So what was supposed to happen in the like the because you know something goes wrong and people who die aren't supposed end up not dying, and so there was like a big uh, train wreck that did a chemical release, and it was supposed to actually like kill everybody in this town but because of the people that got involved they stopped the train wreck from happening by accident and then so it uh so it happens later on and then what it does is it starts turning the town's folk into zombies so that they start like killing each other so to kill the whole town and then the characters are trying to survive one of them is a serial killer who uh you know kind of is glorying in this but at the same time trying to find a way to survive and i wrote a a couple chapters of it, I think, before the Black Flame line folded. So, and I would sit here and just make some popcorn and listen to that story for an hour. <laughs> uh, we can just tell us how it goes. Um, yeah, Jason X, I wanted to share with you. I went to the theater. That was the first uh, Jason movie I ever got to see in theaters. And uh, I don't know if that's why, but it's it's one of my favorites. Even though a lot of people say it's the worst, I think it's quintessential Jason. It's just in a different setting. I thought it. I thought it hit yeah. all the marks. So. Yeah, it's not. It, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's the worst at all. It's fun to watch the little, uh, the little uh, kind of winks and nods, like when the one couple's having sex. That's when finally the Jason corpse starts to move. It's hysterical, but uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Yes, it is. Um, uh, as far as protege goes, Sean, the one thing that always stands out to me about this, I got to bring up, is the nightmare fuel that is having a pregnant woman getting needles. Like yeah. injected into her belly, like we're... <laughs> that was that was great. That was great. 
That Where definitely kind of – that freaked me out like when uh, – what was it? Taryn in uh, Nightmare, Nightmare 3 where she got the needles in her arms. Like yeah. it, it was that level of cringe. But, but ten times – ten yeah. times more like, oh, my God. <laughs> well, I love that's how it starts because like when, when it starts, she's driving the car and then she sees like this burn victim in a burned out car and it's Freddy. And then the car starts waking up. Just I thought it was a really interesting visual that, you know, she stopped for a stranded motorist and it was just – it started. I love the the tone that's set by the beginning of this. It it, it definitely was the Freddy I remembered from the movies that playful but kind of scary at the same time. Because I I think there there was one Freddy book that we read where Freddy kind of got annoying like halfway through, and it just I don't know hmm. if it was the writing or if, I don't know if it was because the plot was so stretched out. But nowhere in here did I feel like Freddy was uh, extra. I felt like he, there was a there was the right dose at the right time. Uh, for him that's good yeah. yeah i think a lot of times when you're writing with characters that already exist that is one of the hardest things to do is to try to find a way that it will feel to people like this is the real the real thing and you know you can't do that for everybody because everybody yeah, everybody has a different freddy in their head at least slightly yeah and so you know you can't match all of that so you're, you do your best to, to to get the most people that you can when it comes to those sort of things so i'm glad it worked for you guys you know, I've, from what I've seen the reviews over the years, people seem to feel like it it did that. So I was pleased with that. I actually, I took a, co a couple notes when I was rereading it. Uh, there are a lot of throwbacks to different uh, Nightmare on Elm Streets as far as uh, her being pregnant, dream child. But then when it talks about, um, you know, like the umbilical cord and everything like that was definitely a lot of uh, Nightmare 5. But um, when he was when he killed the gerbil when he was a kid like that was like you know freddy six and then i just i just had like all these notes so all the throwbacks so i was just like there's a lot in here hey, um buckle in you got a couple of fans that are gonna dote over your book for about an hour here so we uh <laughs> really appreciate no, it oh no it, this is gonna turn into another episode of the chris farley show uh you remember remember when you wrote that uh with uh, <laughs> the bullies yeah that was cool uh <laughs> But no, I bullies. Think... I, I I named all the bullies after actual bullies from my life, <laughs> just their first names. So I thought, you know, there's always that cliche that writers will kill off the, their childhood bullies and their stories, and I never had. And I thought, okay, this is my chance. So that definitely one. explains the uh, three heads are better than none. Like at, at towards the end, like it, that <laughs> definitely explains that because we we've definitely ran through that scenario. If I was a bad scientist, what am I going to do to these people in my life? Mm. And I love the different throwback because like they're in the movie store, but we get a, we get throwbacks to like the 30s and 40s and like monster movies. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. It it, it kind of gave me. I just for the first time this weekend watched the case. abdominal Doctor Fives. A lot more gory and saw like than I expected for 1971. Uh, so that felt a lot like that when I was rereading it last night. Yeah. I'm not movie, so it's a real honor to hear you compare it to that. Yeah, I'm I'm almost done with the sequel. Like I'm, I'm almost there. Um, Did they give but, you the uh, 400 page uh, mandatory thing at Black Plains? Yeah, they yeah they usually give you a limit. The various you know publishers when they're doing tie-ins, and it can be anywhere from some some people would say 80 to 100. Some will say like 90 to 120. So as as best I can remember, this is the length that they they wanted. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, maybe I wrote a little little longer i don't know because uh, sometimes i'll do that you know it's in some sense if you're just doing work for higher stuff you end up doing free work once you get past the you know because you're not going to make any royalties or anything like that on it yeah, it's just right for for hire which is fine you know it's, it's it's the deal and i love doing these things but but you know if you're going to be mercenary about it you stop right at 80 if you can but i don't do that i just keep going to the stories done so i might have wrote a little longer but in general this is the length that they were looking for yeah, well, you did a great job uh, actually filling the pages. Uh, like we said, some people, you can tell that they had to like put, you know, throw plots in, throw extra stuff in just to fill it, which is it works sometimes. Sometimes it's like throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, I was I was curious. Oh, go ahead, Sean. No, go ahead. I'll, I'll wait. I was just going to ask you, Mr. Wagner, uh, what your from your recollection, what was your favorite kill to write for Freddie and why? God, I wrote it so long ago. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, I can't. I can't remember. I can go through the list. Favorite one. Yeah, do that. 
Okay. I feel like like I'm gonna read you the horrible things you wrote about. Um, so <laughs> we got we got the car. Hey, um, <laughs> we got the gerbil. That was particularly disturbing. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, oh, I love the fisherman scene with Fisherman Freddy when they're in the, like he's going for a, like a fishing thing in his dream, and then everything turns red, and Freddy is just like you know like in the in the fisherman outfit. I particularly love that. Um, oh my God, Aunt Becca. The crystal ball. Good mm. God. Um, and then the science teacher with the the way the frog was in class, how Freddie was making the frog talk, and yes. then the, the the teacher gets it. Oh, that that was that that was felt very high school to me hearing all that. Okay. Uh and then uh yeah, Jerome with the hockey mask and the machete, like he went full Jason for a good chunk of this novel. So <laughs> Yeah. yeah, when I when I read that part, I was like, "Oh yeah, you're you wanted to get a Jason book in too, didn't you?" That would have been that, that was my thought process at that moment. Like, yeah, well, a lot of that's just for because it's just fun for fans to see those small things. Like somebody who's just for whatever reason would have picked it up just because they heard you know saw one or two Freddy movies, they might enjoy it. But for the people, you know, these things are written for people who love the movies, and so I wanted to make sure that the people who did love the movies, you know, got all kinds of little bits and pieces in there, uh, just for fun. You know, I just love that kind of stuff when I read these kind of books. So it kind of gave me, um, uh, it reminded me of Sleepaway Camp. Was it Sleepaway Camp Two, where they're trying to scare Angela dressed like Freddie and Jason, and she dresses like yeah. Leatherface and taps them? <laughs> That's what I had. Right. This really felt like that here. Like like fan service and uh, really you know uh, connecting with the fans on that level, um, wow yeah I, I had a thought there and it and it and it left me, um, but I did I do want to say the frog scene was great it felt like something that I would have loved to have seen on the screen, and uh, yeah. Sean what was your favorite kill all all together. That is hard to say. Well, while you're looking, I feel like we need more of these books. Like there's so many novelizations direct, you know, to the movies. But this is like one of the only times outside of young adult books that these characters or any slasher characters really have gotten original stories, uh, you know, because outside of like fan fiction online and stuff. But like in I think there's a market for that. You know, there's there's a lot of horror fans out there. I wish that they would give this another try, republish these books and maybe do some more. Um, but you said everybody's told us how they folded. So I guess that, you know, they'd be looking at that and be like, ah, oh, that didn't work. So that's just kind of well, not necessarily, you know, because they, they've done a lot of comics with, you know, various things where they've had things like, you know, Ash versus Michael versus somebody else. I don't know, Jason or whatever. And those things seem to be pretty popular. I think just what you would need is a publisher to pitch it because usually that's the way it works. The publisher goes to the license holder and says, we have this cool idea for some books. What do you think? And they, you know, the license holder approves it or doesn't. And then the editors go look for a writer to write it. So I think if some, uh, you know, everybody who's listening should like write your <laughs> write publishers and say, we would love to see these kind of things. Um, it's it might be possible there's a small press publisher called uh i think Mo i can't remember that. monster monster apocalypse monster encyclopedia something and but they do um they do like tie-in novels you know novelizations of uh like 80s movies that people uh, uh it's not like they've forgotten them, but they weren't super hits or anything. Yeah. But they that's one of the things that they do. And so a publisher like that might be able, if they can get the rights to do a novelization to, you know, sort of a lesser known slasher movie, you would think they might be able to get the the rights because they know who the rights holders are to maybe do some original ones. So yeah, I think that's I think that'd be really cool. And uh, yeah, that was special. I don't know if anybody's ever done anything quite like that before. So I was, you know, thrilled to be able to get to do one of those. It was like Christmas for me at the time. I don't know about other listeners, but like uh, I'd go to the bookstore, uh, Barnes and Noble, I believe. Uh, it's the only one we had. In, I live in kind of a small town in rural Arkansas. But um, every time I'd go, there'd be a new uh, Friday the 13th or Elm Street Black Flame book out, you know. And I, I didn't think they were ever going to end. And I'd look in the back of the book and there's like five listed for each. And a whole page of like Twilight Zone, Final Destination. It's like, OK, so I'm going to go broke. Um, but yeah, every time I, I think that that would go over good, even better now, uh, cause horrors kind of had a resurgence, uh, in recent years. So 
especially the the slasher. Yeah, I'm pulling it so bad. Yeah, I've been reading. I haven't seen Thanksgiving yet. Uh, you know, Eli Roth's movie, but I've seen some articles. Things. Yeah, I want to go see it. I just haven't yet. But the I've seen some articles that are talking about why this is a great time for slasher mm-hmm. movies, and why that's the even the critics love it so much. But it's because the slasher has been so movie has been so embedded in so many people when they were young, and now they're coming of age as either consumers or creators or whatever. And uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think this could be a really good time for something like this. Video, yeah. the video game market is hitting it. Uh, the slashers are popping yep. at Dead by Daylight, uh, Friday the 13th, which is kind of, you know, on it's it's going away right now. But uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, mm-hmm. there's one that I think could use an original novel. Uh, it, I think it's had one book ever, and that was the Black Flame uh, novelization for the 2003 movie. You know, right. it's just a shame that there's not more of these. And it's a shame that we didn't get a Final Destination in Jason X from Tim Wagner, because uh, <laughs> those sounded really, really great um d- i do so, have my favorite kill now yes i was i was waiting go ahead <laughs> it's um so when jerome is in kind of like the mad scientist laboratory and it's dr kruger and his nurse is the three-headed gang member and then like the, the fight that goes there because freddy takes it really personally but it goes from playful to scary and that's kind of the good dynamic where you get to see all of freddy's emotions in one scene um, I could definitely see it in like flickering black and white, um, like House on Haunted Hill 1999 is the vibe I got from that particular scene. Uh, so I could see that. Or uh, not even that, like uh, House of Thousand Corpses, uh, the Dr. Satan at the end, uh, yeah. a lot of those vibes. Yeah. 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 That were great. There were so many great scenes, action, you know, like a, a car chase, uh, just all kinds of great stuff in this book. The video store was some of my favorite, favorite moments. Just because that's one of my favorite memories as a kid and teenager is going to the video store. You know, there's yeah. just so many stories everybody has. At least I do, and people I know uh, going. Oh, in the okay, in the video in the video store scene where he's seeing stuff come out of the movies, he sees like a scarecrow hand with a scythe. I have to ask everybody present here: Have any of y'all actually seen a really good scarecrow horror movie? Because I feel like for some reason no one can crack the code on it. Everyone I see is like almost good, but then what's make what makes it not good kind of goes in the opposite direction. Uh, I just Wizard feel like I Oz. haven't. No, oh, okay, Jacko. No, that one's not good. Uh, not of the Scarecrow. Yeah, there's got one just called Sca- There's because I watched one called Scarecrow when I was growing up, and it was about this nerd that got picked on. And I think his drunk dad beat him to death in a cornfield and he became a scarecrow to get revenge, but he ha- he could do like karate and he does all these unnecessary flips when he takes out people. And it was like when they decided to kill him or they bullied him when they killed him, it was the last straw. And oh, then it was like, God. scarecrow, <laughs> you've never been stalked like this. And I'm like, could you lay that oh. on any thicker? And then I guess the <laughs> sequel, he goes to the beach. So I don't even know how that one went. Oh my, um, there's a sequel. Oh God, okay. <laughs> it's Scarecrow Scarecrow Gone Wild or something where it's supposed to be attacking beachgoers. Like, I Google saw it in the video. Alive. There you go. I saw it in Blockbuster, but I never actually rented it. Maybe I should do that. <laughs> I don't know. Well, so what they need to do is have a Scarecrow that's like can command like the actual corn. So like corn stalks, you know, grow up out of the ground, at, you know, it's command or whatever can attack people. And I think that's what know, they were trying so- with the Children of the Corn remake. I was about to say, yeah. he who walks behind the row, maybe Rose, maybe make that like a he who walks behind the scarecrows. <laughs> there you go. There we you got go. it. We're brainstorming here. Yeah, we're gonna ride it. We're gonna ride it. Um, no, I was gonna ask um, to fast forward a little bit in time. How did the Halloween Kills come about for you? So oh, I had already uh, yeah the the book publisher was Titan Books, and I'd already done a number of tie-ins for them. I've done like. I did three original um, novels for Supernatural, and uh, I did a couple other, I think, three novelizations for them. One for um, Resident Evil, the final chapter, and Triple uh, X, The Return of Xander Cage, and um, Kingsman, The Golden Circle. And they just contacted my agent and said, you know, do you think Tim would like to do this? And I was just like, Yes, yes, please. <laughs> so I killed to write Michael Myers. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I sat there in the theater. He was that was the movie where I first learned the 
how fun slasher movies could be because it's hard to imagine but back when it came out i mean it was terrifying it was kind of like jaws when it first came out which if you weren't there you can't imagine same with star wars um and i went with uh my sister's boyfriend at the time and we were sitting behind like these very young women that screamed at everything and i thought it was so tense but my friend was laughing you know and having a great time and somewhere along the way i got it it clicked for me and uh i just didn't not only was it just a great movie but i just enjoyed the hell out of it so and michael's been one of my favorite characters it's my oldest daughter's favorite and so being able to do that, that was a it was pretty cool she was pretty thrilled by that awesome hello michael myers is his lore has been taken in so many different directions but i guess there's not a slasher who hasn't really you know um what did, where do you land oh sean good scarecrow thing he brought it up right there it's not a movie it was an episode of supernatural it's actually a really I was thinking good about that one yeah yep. i don't know where that came from well, yeah, like episodes, yeah, like they're a Goosebump episode about Goose or Scarecrows was great, but the moment you break 45 minutes, I don't know what happens. Like something about the second act of Scarecrow, like can't can't get it. But uh, yeah, Michael Myers, uh, as if he wrote the book, great job as always. I don't think I've read anything that wasn't great that you wrote. Um, what timeline do you prefer uh, when it comes to Michael Myers, since we have so many of them now? Oh, that's really that's a great question um you know honestly the, the 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 first two movies by themselves probably um are the ones i'll rewatch the most um at the time i really liked four and five uh because i just it was just really cool to see michael come back but the fact that they worked so hard to make you know kind of a a little world a little universe just out of those two movies even though there's no way in hell i believe michael survived from, yeah <laughs> you know just be it and whenever they do these movies where somebody's been in a coma for 20 years then they get up and i'm like you you can't walk <laughs> you, i don't care how supernatural you are so i shot in the face set on fire and he's been right. laying down for 20 years right. but somehow he's just you, you, um, you not 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 just that not just that when he first wakes up he puts a thumb through someone's skull like it was yeah, butter yeah. like right you're, you're gonna fall yeah, when the, there's gonna be a mess <laughs> like just stay in yes. bed get some years ago simon hawk wrote uh he did novelizations of the first six uh friday the 13th novels and what he did was he he made it that jason was a mutant that could heal like wolverine which is why why all these things could occur and when i read that i was like you know if you're going to make a series and you want to at least try to make it somewhat plausible I guess that makes sense. Uh, but so, and I, you know, I thought that I'm trying to think of the other ones that, that I like. I didn't like Six really well, which was a shame. Six was like the, the screenwriter that actually asked me if uh, uh, he could option one of my original novels once upon a time. And I've, I should have just said yes to see what would happen. But I was like, God, I hated that movie so much. I don't know if I can do that one. Um, the one that had. Uh, the uh the one guy who was in this friday the 13th series and he had the bounty hunter and that's where they have like the little tattoo of the cult of thorn or whatever i thought that was fun because they were trying to do you know introduce some stuff that never got followed up on yeah. so you know i guess overall i pretty much like them all except for six <laughs> one that i don't don't watch uh, you know that often i didn't like halloween uh ends that well i know what they were going for in general but I just, it, which is an interesting idea, but I just didn't, I'll revisit it again someday and see, but that was probably the one I liked the least in a lot of ways. I like this. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that one where it's like, oh yeah, you'll, you'll like Michael when he's living in a pipe down by the river. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I it's agree about like one and two. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, it's like the TV series Gotham. I mean, who wants to watch Batman without Batman, which is right. just kind of what we got with that one. At least with at least with Smallville, he still had his powers and stuff, and you can introduce stuff from yep. the comics. But yep. it's just it's just a kid, right? Yeah. Um, no, um, Michael Myers uh, one and two. When when him and Lori are brother and sister, I thought that it added kind of a more creepiness to it for me because as long as he's alive, she can never have peace. You know, taking that sibling angle away kind of made it like she's just a paranoid woman that thinks he might come back for her one day, but really he has no reason to. She's just another victim that he didn't get to finish off. 
You know, right. she's the one that's obsessive, not him. So that's the only complaint I had about the new trilogy. I still had fun with it. I love how they beat the crap out of him, shoot him, stab him in Halloween kills and just say, OK, nobody watch the body. Everybody just, you know, go do your own thing. He's not going to get up this time. Don't cut his that's head right. off. That's where, that's where my dad always yells, cut his head off, like Friday the 13th remake. Like they just kept stabbing right. him. And yeah, but, you know, Halloween H2O was the first time that they um, retconned the sequel and all that, you know retcon sequels and it's just like this is the new part two or part three like they've done that so many times now now i hear they're doing they're going to reboot the series again but that's another i digress um which slasher was the most fun to write for that's the question that i had written down wow um they're, they're all different so they've all been great to write i mean michael was a challenge because writing scenes with him i mean he doesn't exactly have a point of view so i had to write him i had written a couple of you know sort of creature feature you know monsters eat people novels and i had written from the point of view of uh these things they're just dinosaurs eating people but i had to find a way to create a point of view for them that was not a sentient point of view and so i had a lot of fun trying to write that with michael and hint at that um uh, like i i told you before we started uh, the news just came out that i did the I've written it. It, hasn't, it won't be out till February. The novelization of Terrifier 2. And then being able to write uh, Art the Clown, who doesn't speak. <laughs> and I had to go ahead and somehow indicate his character when I cannot, you know, equal what, uh, you know, the actor does. I, I cannot even show that on the page. I had to find a way to do that. And I'm still waiting to hear from the creators if they feel like I did a good job. But that was a really fun challenge, too. But it was the same kind of thing. It's how do I find a way with words to communicate something that, in general, was originally and probably best communicated, uh, you know, in images. Uh, so that, so um, yeah, all of that. But Freddie was great because, you know, it's it's there's so much freedom because he's got all these different scenarios you can come up with. And it's probably a lot easier to fill up a book with Freddie because you're like, okay, here's another dream. You can just torture somebody else in another dream scenario and, and try to find a way that the scenarios like still psychologically illuminate character or show something about him and what he's trying to do. And so you can actually make them fit a novel really well. Um, and this, that kind of thing is kind of my jam. I still do stuff like that. I'll have dream sequences and, and novel dream sequences are great in novelizations because you never know what people are dreaming when they sleep in a movie. Yeah. Or what they're thinking. So, That's what I love about that. Yeah, what they're thinking, yeah. Speaking of that, um, in some of the other Freddy novels, it I know there are budgetary constraints whenever the movies happen, but when a lot of the novelizations happen, we got these really elaborate, very big, large-scale dream sequences. What I liked about this book is that like, it was almost the blueprint for someone to make it with the budget they might have had in the 70s with the, a lot of the prosthetics and the makeup to do the extra heads and uh, the hands coming out of the video cases if it was done from different angles. Like, I just feel like this movie would be a filmmaker's dream Very to practical. do not a lot of green screen, but to do practical effects. Like the old days, like the like the 70s and the 80s, like back before they started just making everything cartoonish. Yeah. Right, yeah, I did that on purpose to try to, because there's an intimacy to the, to those kind of movies uh where it really is you know the person with the slasher uh face to face or at least soon face to face and you know if i had like had people wandering through the dream universe whatever it is and uh, almost like it's a twisted wizard of oz kind of scenario and freddie showing up every once in a while i just don't think that level of intimacy would have been there it, it wouldn't have felt like a friday the 13th i mean a nightmare on elm street story and so i did do that on purpose i'm glad that worked yeah, that's, I mean, you can look at stuff that fails and, and doesn't, like Ghostbusters versus Ghostbusters 2016, then Afterlife. Ghostbusters 2016 went all in with, like, CGI and everything, and they lost what made Ghostbusters so special, which was the practical. And uh, there you go, right there. So the fact that you wrote it that way, uh, that just adds to just how much we can tell you respected the material, uh, the source material, and, and had to have been a fan. So uh, we appreciate that. Uh, you thoroughly entertained us with this book. Um, that's that's the goal. Sean? I did feel I did feel like um, 
a little bit of Star Wars with Jerome, where they were like, oh, Jerome tries, but he's got that anger, and it's like, he's too much like his father. That's what I'm afraid of. Like, that little bit of Freddy <laughs> showing, like, the little bit of Vader that was showing in Luke. Right. Uh, that that was right. a good, like, dynamic of the fighting, like, within himself. Was, you know, I never got to ask this question before of one of these Freddy books. Were you required, because this is something we noticed in multiple of, of the Freddy books, were you required to leave that sense that Freddie didn't lose at the end or was that a choice you made like that little the end or is it type thing you know no, that, that's just a choice okay. because you know so many not even just the those movies uh, at the time you know in the 80s but just growing up as a kid so many of the the you know movies i'd see like on the you know saturday afternoon horror show you know my local one they'd end with the end question mark so uh, you know, you, you know, I just felt like doing that because it was fun. But no, I didn't have any kind. I don't remember, you okay. know, the editors giving me any kind of stricture for that. Okay. Um, yeah, it's something we just. But also, you know, you got a you got a character that powerful. It's kind of hard to believe that you know one person or whatever is going to finally do them in. It's more like, well, crap, you've ruined this plot of mine. I'll just come up with another one. <laughs> well, I appreciated the not so happy ending, you know, because that's it's more real that mm -hmm. way. Yeah, and Jerome had a hell of a battle, you know, uh, yeah. externally and internally. So um, it was never gonna it was never gonna be roses and rainbows for Jerome. And uh, yeah, any did you have of, uh, more protege questions, Sean? No, I was just gonna say that it kind of reminded me of um. There, there's a scene in this book for you know whoever's uh, reading it that he tries to commit suicide by throwing himself into the river, but it was it was almost like the Incredible Hulk where it's like what's inside him is not going to let him get away that easily. So I, I felt like a lot of the conflict of he has so much anger and power to do massive amounts of chaos that he's fighting. So there are a lot of elements of a lot of really good. Um, what am I trying to say? There's a lot of like other culture, like woven into this as far as like Freddie and all of the movies that were going on along around that time. So I appreciated the depth of, of all the layers in this book for a Freddie novel, because, um, you know, trying to get that balance is difficult. And I feel like a lot of Freddie books have struggled with that. But this one was a smooth ride and uh, we we'll love to see somebody take it and make it a movie one day and maybe we can get Robert England if we, we pay him enough money he might come back one last time even 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 like a great production fan film or something you know because I've seen some really good fan films recently uh you know they just did a Wes Craven's new nightmare sequel uh that a lot of people have enjoyed I thought it was pretty good too um did Aunt Becca before before we finish anything up here on this uh did you was she based on anybody that you ever knew or met or was she just completely a product of your imagination? Yeah, I think maybe bits and pieces. I mean, the closest thing was I had an Aunt Becky growing up. who was like a second mother to me. But so I, you know, I just changed the name a little bit, because especially since usually with these things, you have a short deadline anyway. And because of what happened, you know, where I, you know, they I'd already written like 60 pages and they said, nope, new story. And they still had to go through an approval process, too. I didn't have a lot of time, so. That's kind of why I pulled bullies' names out for characters and just as fast as I could. But I changed, you know, changed the spelling of it a little bit, the name of it. But other than that, you know, usually when I make up characters, I try to pick little bits and pieces of uh, people I might know or just different parts of myself and, you know, kind of just mold it together so that nobody can really tell. That's the best thing about writing fiction. You can write about your friends and family. They'll never know. And they'll take this other character and say, that was me, right? It's like, had nothing to do with them. And you're like, oh, yeah, sure, sure. But if, that was you. Three bullies call, though. Oh, yeah, that was you. That was definitely you. <laughs> they don't. They would never even remember me at this point. So I doubt any of them could read. So, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh there we go. Dim gets so, the final yeah. word. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to we're going to put any website, anything like that down below for people to check out author's page. What are some uh, first time Tim Wagner uh, readers? What what are some books you would recommend? That's a really good question. Um, well, if, any, if you want to read any of my times, like if you want like a, a, a slasher one, it's really hard, you know, to find uh, copies of, uh, of Protégé. Um, um, I do have on that. Um, I found... 
So there's a public free library. Um, mm-hmm. They yeah. actually have a they have an ebook copy now of the, of your oh, book. Cool. Um, I found it yesterday, and they they digitized it, so you just flip right through, and it's it's really nice. So if anyone wants to oh, read good. it, I'll, I'll I can add the link later when we're uh, yeah, please do. This. Yeah, I, that's yeah, but, awesome. Yeah, Somebody took the great. Yeah, I'll put that up on my website so people can find it. Uh, but yeah, I I got to the point where I actually had. Uh, given my last copy to um there's a horror studies program at, at pittsburgh university and they have an archive for horror writers and they wanted copies of my books and i just had one i'm like okay fine then i remembered i donated one to my college where i work so i stole it i stole it back and, it, <laughs> and it's and kind it, of you know crumpled up or whatever but at least i got a copy of my own still that's good but don't tell my college that i stole it from them i'm gonna edit that part no i'm just kidding <laughs> just edit it out edit it out josh <laughs> Um, but so, you know, uh, so, but Halloween Kills is, you know, it, I tried to write it so that it would work as a story all by itself. Um, I tried we did to get more of Lonnie in that in book. Hmm? We got to go, like, we got more um, thought process of Lonnie and yep. his, his yep. interaction with Loomis. I, I enjoyed all the extra. Um, it really makes you feel more for, uh, I can't remember his name. He's the uh, the other inmate that's free running around. Like, yep. Yeah. Hold on. Tell me, I can't. I didn't remember. think I could feel worse for that guy after seeing the movie, but yes, Mr. Tivoli. Tib- yep, yep. Um, yeah, most of that I, I added most of that stuff. Yeah, there was I, a tiny bit in the previous novel about him being obsessed with like it was, I guess, in the script that didn't show up in the movie, but they warn the, the reporters, you know, be careful your shoestrings or whatever, don't get too close. And so, I, I built on that, but yeah, I decided, you know, there's this poor son of a bitch going through this horrible stuff, and it's yeah, I wanted to you know, see if I could, you know, make him even more sympathetic. Because once you see the movie, you're like, wow, he's, you know, that's the weird thing about doing novelizations is that most of them, the all the stuff that people complain aren't in movies, you know, in terms of like characterization and deeper theme and whatever, at least for all the ones I've done, all of that stuff is in there. It's what gets cut out. They don't put it in. Uh, so I'm always like, this is great because at least the screenwriters, you know, full work can get in there. Yeah. Um, with ter- with Terrifier too, that because it's so long, I guess everything in the script's in the movie, so that was pretty cool to see when I saw the script. That's very. While we're on that subject, um, they just released the Hellraiser Bloodline script on line right now, so you can buy it now. It came out like a week ago. Dude, that's awesome! Before cool. everybody started butchering and cutting that movie to shreds. Hey, I thought Alan Smithy directed that movie to perfection. Okay, <laughs> he's always good. Yeah, the birds too. I mean, come on, Alan Smith. He's right. He's on top of it. Uh, so yeah, check out Halloween Kills. There's going to be a link to check out the ebook of Protege, and uh, all kinds of information on Mr. Tim Wagner. Tim, thank you so much. Was there anything that you wanted to say in closing? Well, just thanks so much for having me, and th- thanks for for being patient with the fact that I don't remember everything. <laughs> It's, from somebody I wrote so long ago. It was a blast. Time just flew by. Uh, we'd love to have <laughs> yeah, you on the after. It was great. Sometime, where we just kind of... Yeah, oh, thank sure. you for... Yeah, yeah, anytime you want. I'd be happy to come back. Okay, sounds great. Uh, Sean, anything in closing? Nope. nope. I'm good. No I appreciate problem, you coming Sean. on. Be excellent to each other, everybody. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Sean. And uh, everybody have a happy Thanksgiving week, and we'll see you soon. All right. And this is Sean Campbell saying, if this one doesn't scare you, I can't see a thing.